Uh, before we do any presentation at Royal Roads, we always acknowledge that we live, learn, and work on the traditional lands of the Kosepsum and the Kwangan ancestors and families. And learning has been happening here for countless generations. We're very grateful to be on this land. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that we are in month seven of an extremely complex time, of course, with the global health crisis and all the inequity issues that have been highlighted uh, politically. There's just so much going on, and that's really what this series is about. I know Charles will speak to it in a, in a moment as well, but um, Royal Roads is really about finding a way forward, about being change makers and creating positive impact in the world. So uh, that's why we wanted to offer this series, is just uh, bringing people together in a community and uh, talking about uh, different ways of looking at things and, and possible solutions. And probably many of you are familiar with Royal Roads already, but I just wanted to familiarize you in case you weren't. So Royal Roads is based on Vancouver Island, BC in Canada. So we are a public university. Uh, we were created initially in 1995 as a university intended for working professionals. So we offer a variety of different delivery models. We've been doing online learning for 25 years. As you can see with the castle, we also are a national historic site. So um, there's many beautiful things on these grounds. Um, many of us haven't been there for a while, but they are lovely. So if you haven't already familiarized yourself with us as a physical landscape, we definitely would love to, to see you there at some point. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Charles to take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm Charles Krizikoff. I'm the program head of the Royal Roads MBA program, a professor at Royal Roads, and I focus on international economics and international business. And uh, while you can see the castle, the beautiful castle behind me, I'm not on campus. I'm, I'm at home in Machosan, uh, close to the Skianu First Nation at, at Beecher Bay. And we have a beautiful sunny day here. So we're looking forward to this second episode of the Insights for Action webinar series. And this Insights for Action webinar series really came about because there's a lot of conversations, a lot of discussions among the students, among the faculty, the associate faculty, such as Brian, who's presenting today, uh, about these different issues that really impact our times. And so we wanted to find a way to get more of the information and some of the conversations and learning that we have within our programs uh, out to a wider audience. So we started the Insights for Action series to highlight some of our uh, faculty, associate faculty, and also students. And so today we're joined by Brian Parrott, who's going to be presenting today's talk along with a couple of students from the Royal Roads MBA program. So our MBA program is really a mid-career program. Uh, people have significant amounts of work experience. And so as with many Royal Roads programs, it's really a co-learning experience. So we're instructors, we're working uh, with some material and presenting topics to the students, but the students themselves are out there working full time and have much more expertise in their own areas, their own geographies, their own organizations and, and uh, industry areas. So it's a sharing way. And so we're gonna talk about risks, for example, today, and then get a couple of examples of case studies of how those risks actually impact organizations here in Canada. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Brian Parrott and I will say this session will be recorded. It will be archived. It will be up on our site, uh, on the Insights for Action site, as was the previous talk. Uh, our first talk was Leading in Chaos and Conflict. And so you can see that uh, link to that talk and this talk. And then next month, we have another talk that we'll talk about towards the end of the session. So Brian, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Charles. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and participating in this. Um, I'm relatively new to academia. I've taught this course, uh, the environment of management is the course that I teach uh, one, once. Prior to that, I was, uh, I've recently retired from Global Affairs Canada, where I was posted uh, as a senior executive in uh, Japan, the United States, uh, Britain, and latterly India. And when you're posted abroad with Global Affairs Canada, risk is something that one has to pay attention to. We have all kinds of issues. Uh, India was, uh, well, first of all, starting with Japan, earthquakes. Um, India was particularly interesting. It's actually a very kind of a dangerous part of the world. 
But uh, we also had an earthquake in Nepal that I was very much involved in um, getting Canadians out of that uh, danger zone. And, and um, in my role as a trade commissioner, a senior trade commissioner, really country risk was what uh, we were often advising companies on because once they're into a, com a country, uh, they have to very much pay attention to what risks uh, that kind of investment can pose. So I'll, I'll start in, that's my background. Um, risk is something that uh, uh, I've been paying attention to for quite some time, as I said, because of my international experience. Um, a, a lot of this work is based on uh, a couple of books, but uh, one that I've found particularly insightful is called uh, Global Risk Agility and Decision Making, which was written by Daniel Wagner and uh, Dante Desparte, and, in, and they released this book in 2016. At the time, they said uh, the rules of engagement in the globalized business world had changed. And I think looking back on that after four years, uh, I think we might say that was a bit of an understatement. They said though, and I think a lot of the literature points to how globalization has changed how we work in the world, um, instant communication, but also the rise of terrorism, ISIS. Um, the 28, uh, 2008 uh, global recession changed how financial institutions and insurance companies and everybody looked at global risks, as did, as, and, the, and the other thing that changes is, is sort of global trends. So the trend of urbanization, uh, the growth of the middle class and in the rapidly developing world, and all of these have added to the complexity of risk, many of which are now considered to be man-made risks, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So today what I wanted to do was, was um, look at the complex world that we live in by briefly examining some of the global events that can lead to new risks, explore the challenges that managers face, managers face and then with the help of two of my previous students, uh, uh, Grant Crawford from Saskatchewan Power, and Leslie Johnston, who is an anethiologist in um, Newfoundland, and she's also responsible for the administration of four hospitals. So they have tremendous experience, and as a result of their participation in the class, I've certainly learned a lot about the health system and, and infrastructure. Uh, so with that, we'll move on, uh, Alana. So since 2016, when uh, Wagner and, and Desparte said that it's a complicated world, the world has indeed further changed. Uh, Xi Jinping has solidified his power in China. Uh, he's introduced the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, there are certainly Chinese uh, assertions and, and uh, dominance in the South China Sea have added to the risks of countries that Canada trades with there. Uh, just uh, not very long ago, a Canadian warship uh, traveled in the Taiwan Straits, which upset the Chinese. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are, are growing uh, with respect to China's changing role in the world that is having a significant impact and affecting risks that we're facing. Um, President Trump's administration, of course, declared a trade war with China, and that has upset uh, many apple carts in Canada because it has a knock-on effect. And that's one of the themes that runs through this talk is, the, is that global risks, you might be sitting um, and sitting thinking, what does the um, uh, civil war in Syria have to do with us? And as I've said in the past, um, the refugees that come from Syria that Canada took in may in fact be living in your community, you may be hiring them. Uh, so there's lots of ways that these global events uh, can impact. Um, unfortunately, this slide shows, um, hides the face of, um, maybe I can minimize this, but maybe others can see it, hides the, the face of the newly re-elected Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand, and she's there because they did a tremendous job on COVID, but now they're facing an economic uh, challenge. Uh, Russia, uh, Mr. Putin is asserting his um, powers in the Arctic, which has a, again a very significant impact on Canada. Uh, Brexit looms. We have a despot in, in uh, 
Belarus, uh, which is now under sanctions. India is rapidly, perhaps, hopefully not, but perhaps becoming the, 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 the most infected country in the world. Um, and Prime Minister Modi has a huge challenge on his hands in order to get the economic uh, situation back to that. The, the rise of populism and, and nativism have, and perhaps fueled by unrelenting social media, has had an impact on, on, uh, on the world. Um, mass migration from troubled countries uh, or climate change ridden cl countries is, is really another issue. And now of course we're facing the coronavirus and all that it has done. Um, and all these trends have a global reach and no country can be isolated from these potential risks. And the trickle down effect to domestic companies, whether they be local or or multinational is um, with us and all organization have really got to be alive to the impact of these world events and trends in order to assess and consider how their organization may be affected by these resultant risks. If you could move on. One of the things that has characterized the 21st century from the past when it looks at global risk is that we're now looking at man-made risks. And man-made risks come in the form of terrorism, social media, loss of biodiversity, etc. Uh, I've received from a friend of mine, uh, the, a woman that I worked with in India, and she's a consular officer, and the, in, the two pictures on the bottom and on the right uh, are her apartment um, because she was in the blast zone and, um, you know, the whole embassy in, in Beirut was shut down and the consular service was terribly affected. Risks are, are really a challenge that are affecting us. And um, with historical data, we've, we've largely been able to look at, at phenomenal and, and, and have looked back and used historical data to predict future. So, you know, 100 year floods, for example, uh, there are some predictive capabilities, but man-made risks, it's much harder and, and more difficult to um, predict these things. And so that adds to the level of uncertainty as well. Next slide, please. And so the complexity of these risks and, and the areas that they fall in are, are changing. And um, organizations are struggling to determine which risks uh, they, they can face. So in 2004, a risk report was initiated by a number of organizations and agencies, including the World Economic Forum. And in 2005, the World Economic Forum uh, started to take that report over and put it together as a, as a survey. What they, what they essentially do is survey hundreds of global leaders and, and um, business folk and, and people in the uh, civil society uh, to determine where they think the risks are. And they produce a report that's published um, in late, uh, well, in time for the, the meeting in Davos and so the last report was produced uh, at the end of 20, uh, 2019 and, and published in 2020 and released at, the, at, at Davos. And organizations are, you know, as I say, struggling to determine what risks they, they face, but uh, this report does provide some help. Now there's an issue here with perception. Obviously the perception of global leaders and, and uh, may be different than a farmer in Central America who's suffering from climate change as a result of, or suffering from drought as a result of climate change. And, and that farmer's perception may be completely different than a CEO sitting in, in New York or uh, uh, the average commuter going to work in London. But nevertheless, uh, these, oh. this is a very helpful sort of framework to, to look at. Next one, please, Elena. And I think um, we all may remember uh, Donald Rumsfeld's famous statement, you don't know what you don't know. 
but really the only certainty is uncertainty. And, and this uh, slide is just an, a, a depiction of, of that, sort of what we know is far less than what we don't know and, and uh, far less than what we don't know we don't know. Um, so the unknown is, is ambiguous and a mystery. It, it can, it's, it's almost impossible to predict or, uh, or anticipate. But we have to distinguish between the, um, the unknown and the unforeseen. The unforeseen would be perhaps a known risk, but not predicted or anticipated by leaders and decision makers uh, in, a, in, a, um, in a collective. So we have the World Health Organization, for example, or a country or an organization. Uh, the coronavirus was an unforeseen risk. I mean, it, it's been on the WEF's, uh, infectious disease has been on the WEF's um, list of global risks for quite some time, but it was unforeseen by many, uh, but it was foreseen by a few. Um, a few being um, Bill Gates, for example, did a TED talk in 2017 talking about how we could prepare for a global pandemic of which nobody did anything. Uh, Laurie Garrett, the, the uh, Pulitzer Prize journalist, has published a number of articles uh, before the pandemic uh, started talking about this was going to happen. And um, a statistician, um, um, Nassim Taleb, also uh, said this pandemic was going to hit us. But so that goes to an important part of the risk uh, continuum, and that is that uh, we've got to pay attention. And really what we're trying to do in uh, 531, the course that I teach, the environment of management, is raise the collective understanding of how global events can impact uh, local organizations or regional organizations, and therefore try to raise the literacy of international uh, issues such that uh, students uh, going on can become more aware and become risk managers in their own right uh, by understanding what's going on in the, in the world. So clearly if we'd paid attention to, to Bill Gates's TED talk, we wouldn't have had the, the, the issue of uh, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, he laid out a framework for how we should have uh, prepared ourselves. He likened it to when he was a young lad uh, and the, the big issue that concerned the world was the nuclear war and how families in the United States had a barrel and filled it with uh, food that they could eat and hunker down in their basement, um, for example. The, ex the example of the Beirut explosion that I just talked about is, is, is another unforeseen event. I suppose it was perhaps unforeseen by or hopefully unforeseen by some, but it was really an event that um, should not have happened if, if people had paid attention to what was going on. And this requires, as I say, managers to, to, to get onto, onto the world uh, news and, and read. I mean, there's so much information out there that it's really important. So that, that's um, one thing, I mean, I, you know, the other thing that happens is, for example, um, and Grant, you may relate to this, um, you know, what people don't pay attention to what's going on in, in many countries. And Romania, for example, is the, a source of many cyber attacks. And what's going on with Romania in terms of their legislation that's protecting uh, the internet and things there you know, nobody would pay attention to it until, of course, uh, something happens. And, and a friend of mine who's responsible for running the uh, Skookum Chuck pulp mill in southeastern BC had a ransomware attack uh, that shut down their pulp mill for um, weeks, in fact. And uh, who would have known that that attack came from Romania and the Romanian players in that case demanded a huge uh, ransom the company chose not to pay that ransom, but uh, and ha basically had to replace all of their IT equipment. So it's really risks can come from anywhere and, and uh, one has to look at that and, and pay attention. So we move on, Alana, please. So this is the chart, uh, the global risk cluster that comes out of the World Economic Forum uh, 
report. This is the a table or a, a grid that they've put together. And on this are the top risks that they're looking at. And you can see I've put a circle around uh, the environmental risks that for the first time in the history of this report, in the 15 years of this report, topped uh, both in likelihood and, and impact uh, climate action failure, biodiversity loss, extreme weather, natural disasters, human-made environmental disasters. So that little cluster, cluster of large uh, green uh, diamonds is really what they were saying we have got to pay attention to. Now, sometimes these perceptions of the global leaders are, are influenced by media, of course. Um, the economic items in the blue there, for, for example, uh, used to be at the top of the chart, so to speak, but the environment is taking hold now. You'll notice that cyber attacks are, are right up there in terms of likelihood and impact. The likelihood is the graph, the, the line on the bottom, and the further to the right, the more likely, and the further to the top, the, the greater the impact. I've circled infectious diseases. As I said, that's been on the World Economic Forum's list for quite some time, um, but the impact is always high and they had the likelihood lower despite some of the folks that I was just mentioning, Laurie Garrett, uh, saying this is going to happen. Uh, another interesting one is the water crises, and I don't think we're really paying attention to that, and Canada will be at the forefront of that because we are the world's largest source of fresh water. Um, I think that's all I'll say on that chart, but you can have a look at it. Uh, this is a little bit easier to digest. Uh, top 10 risks, as, as I've said, the environmental ones are all at the top. Uh, weapons of mass destruction, of course, the impact. Uh, you know, I mean, we can look back at the Iraq war and think of why the Americans uh, did that attack. Um, didn't probably pay attention to, to all of the information that they could have found if they talk to various people. Um, there's just one more slide there before we get into the case studies, Alana. Now this one is basically again from the World Economic Forum report and it, it talks about the connectivity of all of these. Um, so you know you can see on there if you look to the top left, infectious diseases obviously connected to water crises but it's also connected to extreme weather. And of course, climate action failure is connected to global governance and, and all of these social instability is, is um, connected to um, unemployment and unemployment is in, uh, connected to fiscal crises. And underlying all of that is income inequity and the changes that are uh, going on with respect to the developing world versus the developed world and where income inequity falls. And I don't, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see income inequity showing up on this list um, very much in the future. So um, with that, we're going to turn it over to Leslie to talk about um, hospitals and climate change. And, and just before you jump in, Leslie, I found this to be a fascinating, and, and I think it's an ironic uh, situation, but um, again, going back to Charles's comment about how much we all can learn together, uh, this was a fascinating study um, and, and case study for me, and I hope you'll find it interesting as well. So would you like to take it away, Leslie? Yeah, sure. Um, so thanks, Brian, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. Um, I was happy to have the invitation. So as Brian said, um, I'm a clinical anesthesiologist in St. John's, Newfoundland, and 80% uh, of my time is clinical and 20% of my time is spent in the uh, administrative role as the clinical chief for the um, perioperative program for um, our regional health authority. So um, when I did the um, course that Brian was teaching, um, I kind of tied in the impact of climate change uh, or healthcare, I should say, um, which is my industry uh, and its effect on climate change as it was at the top of the um, 
um, charts for the uh, for the uh, economic forum and the world risk. Um, so I'll just put out some stats just to give you an idea of the scope of the problem. So the healthcare industry had been identified as the second largest industrial producer of greenhouse gases, uh, second to the um, food industry. Uh, Canadian hospitals use the equivalent um, electricity consumption of 440,000 homes per year. The average surgical case can produce waste that are equivalent to that of one household family of four per week. So that's each case. And just to give an example, one of my hospitals here has um, 11 operating rooms and each room could have anywhere from two to nine cases a day. Um, so that is a significant amount of waste coming just from the operating room. So while operating rooms occupy a small portion of most hospitals, uh, we actually generate up to 30% of hospital waste just from the uh, operating rooms. Anesthesia in and of itself, um, outside of the irregular waste that we have, uh, is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So there are several gases that we use to um, induce and maintain general anesthesia. And uh, some of these gases uh, are hydrofluorocarbons and some are um, chlorofluorocarbons. So the, um, so desfluorine and sevofluorine are the two most common ones you'll see used on a daily basis in any operating room across Canada. And they are hydrofluorocarbons. So they contribute significantly to greenhouse gas emissions but they don't have any ozone depleting potential. Um, there are other gases like nitrous oxide, which is commonly used in pediatric operating rooms. And also you'll see uh, that being used in many dental offices. Um, and isofluorine is another gas that's not really used as much um, today, uh, but these gases have greenhouse gas effects as well as ozone depleting potential. So the gas that we use kind of goes into the patient and comes out into our machine and then it's vented out into the atmosphere as, as um, waste anesthetic gas. And that's what contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, next slide, please. So in 2015, Dr. Margaret Chan, who was the Director General of the World Health Organization at the time, declared that climate change is the defining issue for the 21st century. So the World Health Organization highlighted the contribution of climate change to many acute and chronic diseases each year, and potentially leading to tens of thousands uh, of deaths annually, and is expected to increase. And just to give you an idea, um, when COVID hit, um, a lot of the hospitals were noticing that um, the number of premature deliveries had gone down and they were wondering where were all the preterm babies. And one um, theory that was postulated was that because there was less pollution at the time, uh, less businesses running, less um, pollution from transportation services, um, that air quality and pollution was um, deemed to be one of the contributing risk factors to preterm labor. So one of, the, one of the unintentional consequences of COVID was that there was a lot less preterm labor. So um, a lot of these acute and chronic diseases that will be attributable to climate change will happen in a lot of third world countries, but a lot of them will happen in our developed countries as well. So I thought it was interesting that while the World Health Organization outlined the importance of climate change on global health, it failed to identify the healthcare sector itself as a significant contributor um, to climate change. Um, next slide, please. Um, so climate change is a problem of global magnitude and deserves a global response. So um, government, I felt, I feel like we, in our hospitals, there's no mandate to do any type of uh, recycling and no sustainability plans for any of the six hospitals that I'm in charge of and, and I'm in the largest center in Newfoundland. And so many um, hospitals across Canada don't have any mandate um, or plan for sustainability um, or any way to address climate change. And there's a lot of really easy things we can do. So um, the op-ed that I had written that um, Brian asked me to kind of present the summary here was um, based on trying to call government to action to legislate mandatory recycling and more sustainability in hospitals. 
Uh, a recent study in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia identified uh, inadequate funding, uh, inadequate knowledge about what to do, and lack of a mandate as the three main barriers to environmental sustainability in the operating room. So um, just to give you an idea of some things we had done locally, in 2012, one of our anesthesia residents had performed a waste audit at one of our hospitals. And she looked at um, laparoscopic cholecystectomies, which is a simple one hour procedure to remove the gallbladder. It's a very common procedure. We might do up to five on one, one list a day. Um, so she found that for each procedure, um, the average waste um, generated was about six kilos. And so by extrapolation data in 2012 and 2013, we did 1,511 of these procedures in Newfoundland, which contributed almost 8,000 kilos of waste by weight to our local landfills. Um, a similar audit at a UK hospital also showed that up to 40% of all anesthetic waste was potentially recyclable. So locally here in St. John's within the last year, I would say. Um, one of our nurses, her name is uh, Patricia Power, and she took it upon herself to um, institute a um, recycling program in our operating room. So she basically made some contacts with the maintenance people, with housekeeping and some environmental services people and the local recycling um, businesses outside the hospital. And now we have outside of each of our 11 operating rooms in our health science center, which is the largest center in the province, um, we have two bins, one's, one for plastic and one for cardboard. So every day that gets collected and sent down for recycling. Um, so again, this is just the initiative of one motivated person and, um, and it's not yet made its way throughout our regional health authority. So my plan now is to kind of elevate this to CEO level and say, listen, this is what we're doing at one hospital. Why is this not done everywhere? And it's something easy. And she was able to do this as one single person. So this should be something that's mandated from above for up for all areas of the hospital, not just the operating room and for every hospital that we're responsible for. Um, I also had a uh, anesthesia resident um, named Yulia um, who uh, was able to institute a recycling program for the little aluminum bottles that our anesthetic gas comes in. So now we're recycling all the uh, aluminum bottles that come through. And again, she made some important contacts through housekeeping, environmental services and local recycling places. And so these are efforts by, um, by single motivated individuals. Um, myself, I have been pursuing uh, institution of um, a Canadian um, technology called Blue Zone, where um, the company comes and installs, uh, they have uh, basically a proprietary technology that can take the waste gas that's being emitted from each hospital and capture the waste gas, recycle it into reusable gas and prevent it from being emitted uh, into the atmosphere. So um, initiatives like this, I believe should be really uh, enforced by government and um, and the blue zone people are actually still waiting on FDA approval to be able to use the recyclable gas. So this is stuff that should be pushed through the FDA. There should be a huge um, push from government to get this out and in all hospitals that deliver general anesthesia because we could be limiting a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions through those things. Um, and in the meantime, while we're waiting for government mandates and legislations and for a regional health authority to do things just comes back to simple principles of reduce, reuse, recycle, turn off the lights in operating rooms that aren't being used. Um, you know, don't throw plastics into sharp spins because th those things are quite uh, expensive to uh, dispose of. And, uh, and just, just being smart about it. It, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, great innovative things, just simply, simply recycling plastics and, uh, and cardboard in each um, operating room would contribute greatly to, um, to our sustainability plan. So that was all I had to say. Thanks very much, Leslie. Now with the next slide, we'll uh, ask Grant to speak to cybersecurity. Uh, Grant is at Saskatchewan Power and is the Director of Asset Management and the Smart Grid. So please go ahead, Grant. You might need to turn your mic on. There we go. 
So we are the uh, largest per capita producer of greenhouse gases uh, of all power companies in the country. Well, my apologies for interrupting you, but you're kind of coming in and out of um, of audio. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, what's going on or if there's a solution. But um, um, maybe talking closer to your your computer. Uh, we'd love to hear what you're saying. Grant. Oh, I think he might have froze. Darn. Yeah. Brian, would it be possible for you to maybe pick up for Grant and just kind of, you probably know a bit of his information. I know you probably can't speak to it quite as well as he can, but um, um, it might well, be better. Grant, hopefully Grant will uh, come back on. Maybe he's just rebooting, but um, this, the, the slide, basically, uh, I can only speak to the slide, really. Uh, but I do know um, <clears throat> that SAS Power has put in a tremendous amount of effort to uh, protect their utility. As, as Grant had said, um, they're a significant utility in uh, Saskatchewan, and um, they're subject to in, uh, cyber attacks as just about every utility in the world is. Um, you can see the number of utilities that have experienced them. And um, they're the biggest challenge, of course, there's loss of private information because every utility has data on all of their customers. And, um, uh, or an outage is even more, uh, there it is, grants coming back, is even more important. Um, So I mentioned ransomware is on the rise. Uh, certainly it's been a f a f a impacted a number of organizations across Canada. Uh, Canada now has, as many of you will know, through B Bill 59, C-59, a new uh, structure to pay closer attention to cybersecurity in Canada. Um, but I think we just should move on. Unless, Grant, you're back. I, I think I'm back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah, great. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where, where I left off there, but I'll, I'll Well, I just kind of went through that first slide, noting um, a little bit about SAS power and, and that ransomware is on the rise, given my, the example that I, I gave. But okay. you go ahead. Yeah, so the, the heart of it for us is like a lot of, uh, a lot of equipment that has very long lives uh, and wasn't traditionally designed to actually be networked, if you if you like. Um, so because of that, a lot of utilities don't have very strong uh, cybersecurity. Uh, a lot of the smart apparatuses uh, that were developed were developed uh, 20, 30 years ago in, in this business. And now as we move towards a more connected network to actually take care of things like distributed generation, uh, to help clean up the environment, uh, we are we are facing challenges in terms of uh, securing our infrastructure, um, and our infrastructure is certainly interesting infrastructure to attack uh, because it actually has a significant uh, impact. It has impact on industry, on residential customers, uh, essentially on everyone. Um, so the the gist of this slide is that. Uh, over half of the utilities out there in the last year uh, have experienced a cyber attack where they've uh, that's resulted in outages uh, or loss of customer information. And a quarter of the utilities out there in the last year have 
experienced a significant enough attack that these are deemed to be nation-sponsored attacks. Um, so it's a, it's a good way to mess with the country's economy uh, if you can take down the power grid. Um, so I'll, I'll just take us to the next slide. So uh, one of the examples that, uh, that I used uh, is one that happened in the Ukraine. Um, and you, you generally won't find a lot of utilities to talk about the cyber attacks that have happened on themselves. Uh, this particular event has been uh, declassified and it's been publicized as an event that uh, other countries, other companies can learn from. Um, so the, the event uh, started out much like uh, a number of cyber events happen. Uh, just emails that were sent out that uh, were spear phishing emails. So uh, people at these companies clicked on the wrong link. And as a result of that, uh, malware was downloaded into their IT systems. And that malware propagated through the back end systems, uh, which allowed the attacker to go and gather credentials from employees in the company. And inevitably, the, uh, they were able to establish backdoor access into the actual control systems of the company, uh, which is generally something that uh, isn't to be allowed for critical control systems. Uh, so once, once they were able to establish that, again, they hunted for more uh, usernames, passwords, until they found their way into the actual control network itself. Um, and so they got legitimate usernames and passwords for, um, for people running the grid controls and inevitably used that to start to shut down uh, systems. So open breakers inside of substations, uh, closed things which uh, resulted in uh, substations basically more or less blowing up. Um, but it wasn't just the attack on the, on the infrastructure piece. They also coordinated the attack on all the IT systems as well. Uh, so they started to shut down the communication systems take away the actual rights of legitimate operators, like their passwords, um, which all made this uh, very, very hard to troubleshoot and restore. Um, so the, the coordinated nature of this is they actually attacked three companies at the same time, uh, took down 27 substations, uh, and basically put a quarter of a million people without power for three hours. Um, credit to uh, the Ukrainian utility that they actually recovered quite quick, given the nature of the attack. Um, the, uh, the assessment of this attack at the end of the day uh, ended up being linked back to uh, Russia uh, with the belief that uh, they were trying to discredit the Ukrainian government um, uh, via this, this type of an attack. Uh, probably go to the next slide. So um, what, what can we do about these things? Um, a, a lot of this comes down to how systems are designed. Uh, so there's an architectural aspect of this, like uh, how we isolate control systems from, uh, I'll say, common internet browsers, um, how we implement things like uh, firewalls as, as passive defense mechanisms, and then uh, more active defense mechanisms are actually uh, intrusion detection type of activities where they're looking for particular messages, uh, looking for where messages come from, uh, if the users are legitimate, and that they can actually start to screen some of those things out. Um, in the case of utilities, uh, utilities do work back very closely uh, with the federal security agencies. Uh, so we, we take briefings from CSIS on what types of threats are out there. Uh, we work with our peers to determine what types of attacks they've experienced uh, so that we can actually be prepared for them as well. Uh, so there's quite a bit of uh, collaboration inside of the utility space. Um, from a corporate perspective, um, again, this isn't an area that utilities have years of experience. In so uh, establishing, you know, credibility, 
establishing accountability for cybersecurity as a whole has been an important aspect for us. Um, and then trying to rebuild those legacy systems so that there's security embedded in those uh, types of systems. Um, so if that gives you kind of some sense, um, I, I know for ourselves, like uh, it's not just the attacks on, on our company, it's the attacks that we uh, experience through our partners, like uh, Brian, you had mentioned, uh, you know, an attack there where they'd uh, performed ransomware on a pulp mill. Uh, we, we've had uh, engineering firms that actually work with us that have been attacked and, uh, and held ransom. And inevitably what they're trying to do is actually find a way through uh, tower networks as well, right? So they're, they're looking at our partners as a means to get inside of our network. That's great. Thank you, Grant. So uh, time's moving on. So I'll just quickly move on as well. Um, sort of having depressed you perhaps over the last 45 minutes, we got to recognize in the entrepreneurial world that opportunities uh, grow out of risk as well. Um, just think of climate change and, and the, 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 the things that have come from developing uh, electric cars, uh, there was another student in our class who looked at climate change and said it was an opportunity for their business because they were in the forest fire fighting business and have taken a number of uh, opportunities internationally where they have used their specialized equipment that was developed in Canada to be used overseas. Think about fintech and the risks that uh, banks have had with uh, bricks and mortar and now moving into the fintech space where people can do so much banking online and and things like that. And so I think from COVID too, we're starting to see some very in, in, uh, interesting changes uh, that will grow out of COVID. And I think we can all think of opportunities in the healthcare business, uh, in education and, and technology development. Indeed, in, in his book in 2012, Nassim Taleb in his book, Anti-Fragile, argues that significant shocks to organizations, people and things make them better. Uh, the subtitle out of, his, of, of the book is Things That Gain From Disorder. And um, if you ever get a chance to read Anti-Fragile, I would highly recommend it. it it's, an, it's a fascinating book. It's not exactly the easiest book to read, but it is fascinating. And, and he paints a picture of the, the whole issue around statistics of, of looking at the fat curve, or sorry, the fat tail most most um, quant analysis goes backwards and looks at things at the back, what has happened in the past to predict the future. And he argues that that's, that's long gone and we have to look at fat tail events as he puts it. Next slide, please. So in the business world, um, the balance between risk and reward is central to profit organizations. And it is upon this that most risks evaluations have been made. As I said in the past, things were looking backwards to try and predict the future. And with man-made uh, risks and uh, the complicated world that we now live in, the, the thinking around risk management is changing and we're having to sort of pro project into the future. As, as Grant has just said, these cyber attacks are not exactly something that there's a lot of data on and people have to work hard to figure out how to predict and assess whether they're prepared. Um, you know, the, 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 the old theory on, not the old theory, but the theory around enterprise risk management, um, ISO 331000, which are risk standards, has been the norm. But in the new world, and what, what people are talking about now is that one has to think a little bit outside of the box, if you will. Um, in 2011, an idea sparked by Mark Carney, then the governor of the Bank of Canada, and the, and the late um, uh, Jim Flaherty, they created the, the Global Risk Institute, uh, it was formed in Canada. And it's, it's, it's actually one of the only uh, risk institutes that I could find um, that pro provides analysis about risk and modern risk analysis for the financial sector. 
Uh, it builds itself to be the premier organization that defines thought leadership and risk management. Um, and although it focuses on the financial sector, I think it's very, very applicable to all uh, organizations. And if you could move on, please, Alana. So one of the, one of the um, uh, products that has come out of this, and this, is, this exemplifies the thinking around global risk and management now, this is a, a, what they call a graph model, and it's, it's, it's sort of similar to a SWOT model, but it, what the, the, key, the key thing that the, uh, the literature is pointing to now with respect to risk management is to build it into your strategic planning process. And so I won't go into this model in a great deal of uh, detail, but the whole, the, the, the tenant, the central tenant of the thinking is that risk is out there. Everybody in an organization has to be aware of that risk. Everybody in that organization needs to, in a sense, be their own risk manager. And you have to start building this into the um, strategic plan. When I was in Global Affairs Canada, we had to go through this process of developing a strategic plan annually with a five-year outlook and then refreshing, et cetera. And a key part of that was indeed putting risk. What are the risks? What are the what uh, what happens in India if there's a terrorist attack and and um, you know the country shuts down? So what happens now with with India, for example, shut down because of COVID? Uh, trying to get a flight to India now is all virtually impossible. So what do we do in an organization to keep the organization running? A business continuity uh, plans, etc., all have to be built in, and it all grows out of this newer concept that risk is part of the strategic plan and one has to build it in. So if you want to move on to the next slide. So a, a number of things that uh, are areas of focus for risk managers. Uh, again, uh, Wagner and Despard in their book called it global risk agility. Uh, one has to look at the governance structure. One has to be aware globally of what's going on. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around avoiding the moral hazard now. I mean, one has to do the right thing. The Beirut explosion was not the right thing. They should have moved that explosive material out of there. They should have had some mitigation plan. It's incredibly important within an organization to build up the trust. And that, that trust is within the organization itself, between the board and managers. It's the trust also between the customer and the company. But in all of this, we can't take risk taking and entrepreneurialism out of an organization. It has to be there. And one has to look at the sort of the appetite for risk, what the culture of risk is in the organization. Is it, uh, you know, you, you can think of a startup, highly risk uh, taking kind of organization. You look at older organizations. And this is where um, uh, Nassim Taleb talks about. Uh, um, fragile organizations, robust organizations, and then anti-fragile organizations, where they've managed to take an anti-fragile organization has taken the risk in hand in their strategic plan and adapted to it and changed. And you can think of an anti-fragile organization perhaps as internet banking as opposed to old bricks and mortar banking or something like that. So being prepared is really, really the only thing that sort of is the common among all of this. In, ter in terms of mitigating risk, one has to be prepared. So there's a business continu continuation plan should be in place and an anticipatory risk management planning should be in, in place as well. So it's taking all of these global things, bringing it back to the local business or the local organization or the regional situation and trying to anticipate, prepare, and be set. We did this, uh, I mean, the global affairs, I don't want to go on too long, but uh, I, I'll, I'll leave it there for questions and, th and then we can, we can maybe raise some other examples. So the, this uh, key references that I use to develop this, the Global Risk Institute is there, the World Economic Forum. I commend all of these uh, reports and books uh, to you. I'll leave it at that, Alana. All right, well, I am going to bring down the PowerPoint and open it up for Q&As. Uh, Charles, I think you've been keeping track of the questions, so I'll let you uh, take over that aspect. Okay, thanks. And uh, 
there have been a few questions uh, posted uh, up. And one, uh, Brian, I think gets to this question around, you know, for businesses themselves who are looking out in the world and there are all these risks and there's social risks and all kinds of different risks. But so how can uh, organizations calculate sort of the potential impact of these different global risks on themselves? I mean, there's the supply chain aspect, but moving beyond that, how does a business sort of think about the world and, and how these global risks might impact them? Well, that's the, uh, <clears throat> that's the $64 question, I suppose. Um, well, I think as I, I tried to wrap up, um, one has to be globally aware. One has to um, have governance structures in place. I mean, it's really important that uh, the board and management, or e even in a not-for-profit organization, um, they have boards and, and managers. Uh, they, they have to be, um, what's the best way to put it? They, they have to be uh, aware that these global uh, risks and, and uh, the realization of a global risk can indeed impact a local organization. I mean, COVID is, it's beyond all kinds of everybody's expectations as to how that would impact organizations, but it's had an, uh, an impact on every organization. And, and uh, Royal Roads, for example, a number of international students um, no longer able to come to, to Canada uh, for a period of time. So what do organizations do to say, well, where are we at most risk? And what if there is a global shock that has an impact on, on this? So those are the sorts of things. Um, being prepared, I mean, the Boy Scouts motto, um, but also looking at risks in order to seize the opportunities that may flow from those risks. I don't know, Charles, if I've answered the question, but it's, it's uh, the best I could do. I guess another thing, and maybe I could use an example from, um, uh, from uh, my experience. A, a Canadian company uh, listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange was very keen on the gambling sector. And they had a number of investments. They were an investment firm and they invested in, in, in um, gambling uh, casinos and, and online gambling. And gambling, online gambling in, in India is actually quite uh, prevalent. And they found an organization that they thought that they would purchase. And they, they came to us after they'd already discussed this opportunity with uh, the company. And they had, I suspect that when they came to the embassy, they had uh, perhaps already decided. But they asked us for advice. And we said, well, I think you need local contacts. You should get a local uh, lawyer and, and a local accounting company that really knows the state in which your investment is going to go. And they said, well, that's very good advice. Can you send us some names? So I sent them a number of names. And then in the end, they decided they would just use international consulting groups and lawyers that they were familiar with in Canada. Um, shortly after their $50 million investment, the governor of the state banned uh, gambling in that state. And so their $50 million investment was pretty much out the window, largely because they didn't pay attention to the local um, or get local advice. And this happens time and time again, and uh, we, we see this a lot in, in the trade world. So it's really uh, getting the local advice, talking to people outside of your company, uh, and getting perceptions that way, because people's perceptions can be drastically altered when they talk to uh, uh, people in a local, in a different country. Another question that came in uh, had to do with the many of these problems. So we could take global warming and the pandemic is, is similar where individual individuals and individual companies and, and even countries can take action. But in the absence of a, a, a more cohesive action by other players, um, one individual has trouble harming. So these are social problems, socially, uh, causing, uh, you know, there are social benefits to all cooperating, but private costs in that, that framework. So just wondering your, your take on how, how do we address some of these big global risks where your individual actions may not, you know, address the risk overall and we need to work together. I guess that kind of sums up the challenge we face with climate change. I mean, um, 
the, the collective in climate change is the entire world. And uh, bringing that together has been fraught with difficulties as we've seen as various uh, um, conferences and, and uh, events take place. And uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a I, mean, I don't know, it's a compelling problem. I, uh, we saw it again in COVID when, when Trump said, no, he's gonna stop exports of personal protective equipment. I mean, how does, when you have these huge problems, it's only the, the, the greater confrontation, not confrontation, but the, the greater um, collective has to, has to come to play. I, I don't have an answer for that, how you do it. Um, it it's, um, it's human nature, unfortunately. We just seem to be prone to doing whatever we can to screw up the planet. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pop on here. Um, I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes. I recognize we're just after one o'clock and I'm sure people have places to be. I did, I did want to just uh, address one more question that, that's here. It was near the end and it was regarding is risk the new language of business considering the social, economic and sustainability commitments. I thought that would be um, a good place to, to kind of end on just because I think there's some, some pithy thoughts in there. So I'll let you speak to that for a minute. Well, I certainly uh, think it is, and I and I think that's why um, we've kind of adapted to looking at risk in in this course. Uh, it, it's really uh, one has to be aware. I mean, we all go through our life with risk. Um, every time you get into a car, you're you're taking a risk of some sort or another. But because of the globalization, the interconnectedness, the instant communication, the 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 propensity of disinformation out there, we just have to pay much more attention to, to risks and think how those risks coming, becoming realized. I mean, a risk is a risk, but until it is realized, it, it doesn't have much of an impact. Um, but we're seeing the realization of risks more and more uh, these days. And so it's really, it definitely should be part of the, the, um, the culture of a company to pay attention to risk, looking at the culture. What is the culture? I mean, if, if one looked at a, an organization now, you could go in and perhaps do an audit on, on um, a risk from uh, uh, anywhere, I suppose, or, 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 or an audit of, of what the culture is and what the governance structure is. And I, I think organizations should pay much more attention to that uh, going forward. Thank you. I want to um, thank everyone for, for staying with us and being with us through this presentation. Um, it's a big topic, lots of information. I really appreciated uh, both Leslie and Grant's perspectives of bringing, bringing the topic alive through their own personal experiences. I know uh, Charles mentioned in the beginning that at Royal Roads, we are about co-creating information, of course, and, and this is such a great example of having our students come in and, and participate in this discussion uh, because of their, their experience and being able to, to kind of give you that real life example. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Brian, so much for, for sharing your expertise and your insights. Um, I'm sure it's given everyone a lot to think about. I know it certainly has for me. Um, I did want to mention that this is episode two of our Insights for Action uh, series that's going to be running right through April. So we will be doing a, another episode next month in November. I believe it'll be November 24th. Uh, it's not quite booked yet, but I will have it booked soon. So if you're not on our mailing list, make sure that you get on it. So the title of this one will be uh, Forging Forward, Leading with Emotional Intelligence. So um, we'll be doing more of an inward focus again. This is kind of the, the um, basis of the series is we're looking at kind of the bigger environment and what's going on externally and how we can navigate that. And then we'll follow up with an episode of um, kind of more looking at the individual and how we can kind of navigate what's going on on an individual basis. So hoping to give people um, lots to work with and, and hopefully uh, some insight that can lead to uh, some inspiring action in your life. So I want to thank everyone again and I hope that everyone has a wonderful day and uh, please be in touch. Most of you should have my email through the reminder emails if you have any follow-up questions or want to be uh, put in touch. I'm happy to help you with that. So thanks everyone and have a wonderful day. Thank you.